Hi everyone, my name is Lu Hen. I'm the postdoc from Church Lab, also the co-founder together with George for the startup eGenesis. Today I'm happy to present to you our progress of using mammalian genome engineering to deliver xenotransplantation as a safe and life-saving procedure. So here we are looking at the number of the patients suffer from the end-stage organ diseases in US. So there are over 2 million patients suffer from the organ failure. Only about 123,000 of them are putting on the waiting list. And only one tenth of them can get transplantation each year. So there's, there's a huge delta and human life is at stake. The situation is worse in other parts of the world, especially in Asia, when there is no donation culture. So hypothetically, there are probably three ways to solve this problem. One, we have more donation. Second, probably as Alex introduced, we can use stem cells to produce an organ. And the approach we take, which we hope can help us get there faster and quicker, is to utilize the uh, animal as a bioreactor and change in the way that human compatible. So the process works in the way that we start by engineering the somatic cell. Then as people clone Dolly, we clone transgenic pig from the engineer cell, then deliver organ to the patient. We didn't invent this idea. So people have pursuing this for more than two decades. And big pharma invested very heavily in the 1990s. But it's a huge failure. And there are two reasons why it didn't work. First, as you can imagine, there are huge rejection issues between the pig organ and human body. And people underestimate how many antigens they have to remove. And there was no tool to do that. Second, people identify the endogenous retrovirus resigned in the pig genome. And if you culture a pig cell together with a human cell, the virus will jump from the pig cell to the human genome. So it didn't work, potentially can become a plague. And that's where we think CRISPR and other advancement in mammalian genome engineering can come to play. And our lab was one of the first lab to demonstrate we can use CRISPR to engineer mammalian genome. We think the beauty of CRISPR is the multiplexibility. With such a tool, we can conduct high throughput engineering to remove the antigen, introduce the immune inhibitory factor to confirm the pig organ human immune compatibility. In addition, we can use the tool to eradicate the virus from the porcine genome to ultimately address the safety concern. So this is a study we published last year. Uh, we first utilized a sequencing technique to identify there are 62 copies of the endogenous retrovirus in particular uh, in, in, the, in the genome of particular cell line we are working at. And we designed CRISPR specifically to tackle the catalytic domain of the reverse transcriptase of the virus genome. And after the treatment, we got the cell line with 100% knocking out of those 62 copies of the virus. And here we are showing that if uh, we culture the pig cell together with a human cell, uh, with our modification, there are still prevalent infectivity, whereas if we do that with our engineer cell line, there were minimum infectivity compared to uh, similar to the, to the negative control. So our work increased the multiplexibility of gene editing in mammalian cell by almost two order of magnitude. And more importantly, uh, we, we demonstrate we can solve the biggest safety issue of xenotransplantation. After that, we move to our second challenge. How can we engineer the pig to have the immunology feature? And over the last one decade, there are some scientific progress that people produce different transgenic pig, and each one of them carries some modification. The good news is all the pig are viable, and they all shows beneficial effect for xenotransplantation. But uh, it takes years for them to generate those pigs, and some of the modification couldn't be implemented. implemented due to the lack of the tool. So over the last few months, we have generated PIC 2.0 cells with 12 modification, which we think can address antibody bonding, complement coagulation, as well as the T cell toxicity issue. In the meanwhile, with the help of the Denmark Aarhus University, we built the somatic cell nuclear transfer system in which we can take the engineered cell, put into the uh, pig egg, and get a pig blastocyst in one week which we are going to do the embryo transfer to get the pig, uh, as well as also a very uh, quick feedback to let us know what's the developmental impact of our modification on pig. 
So um, we are in the process of generating our pig 2.0, and every cell, every tissue, every organ of our pig will ha have the identical genotype. So we think our pig can serve as a bioreactor to produce different organ, different tissue, such as for heart transplant, liver transplant, pancreatic transplant, as well as neuronal transplant. Um, and I hope I convince you that the advancement of gene editing really reinvigorate the field of xenotransplantation. In the meanwhile, I think if we can solve the immunology issue, we can do things beyond that. We can engineer the liver to be cancer resistant, as Jeff mentioned, virus resistant, as George mentioned, or produce some non-essential amino acid, as Harris mentioned, and we don't need to worry about the acid issue if we need to use that directly on human being. So to a certain extent, xenotransplantation opens a back door for us. We can really exercise a tool to push the envelope of gene editing in terms of the scale and complexity, which may have the impact beyond our practice. So last, I'd like to thank George for being a visionary and enable everything happen in my team. Specifically, Mark Guill led all the synthetic biology as well as bioinformatic effort. Uh, don't build the embryogenesis system and working together with Elan to let the effort of the PIC 2.0. And I am, am happy to take any question. So in the, uh, in the paper where you described the inactivation of 62 loci at the same time, uh, these were all PERV loci. Are they, do they include all the PERV families, the C and the D, and the, I think there's an A, and, and do they hit all of them? And then in the cell type that you used to, to achieve this, is, is that clonable, that cancer cell line, PK15? Because I'd be interested if it is, um, yeah. obviously. So Scott asked two questions. First, whether we hit all the PERV family, and second, whether our cell line is clonable. The first one is, yes, uh, there are A, B, C, and A dash C family, and we hit all of them. And there are some pseudogene, and we design the CRISPR in the way that we only target those active PERV, not touch other part to prevent some uh, genomic instability. And the second question, no, the cell is not clonable but we are repeating our process in the clonable cell line and hopefully can produce a transgenic pig with such a feature. Hi, uh, Liam Holt from NYU. So I was wondering about the immune rejection problem and um, I think you were talking about changing the antigenic surface of the cell, but also cells present peptides from the interior of the cell. I was wondering if you could break that pathway so that you aren't getting arbitrary pig peptides displayed? Yeah, so Mian's question is even you can remove the antigen from the pig surface, the, the, the cell debrief will be picked up by the antigen presenting cell by the host, then trigger the indirect rejection. And to solve such an issue, we are not only knocking out the antigen, we are inserting some of the immune inhibitor factor, for example, uh, CTLAIG, uh, which can suppress the T-cell reaction and hopefully can mitigate such a problem. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm a postdoc in Pam Silver's group at Howard Medical. I don't know what chair is here. Uh, so I, I'm the postdoc working on the human artificial chromosomes in the lab. No one else is working on it. We're relatively new to the game, but I'm gonna catch you up in five minutes. Uh, so why are we interested in hex? They're obviously a diverse amount of uh, commercial and academic interests. Nowadays, it's not so easy to, to differentiate between the two anymore. Um, but we're really interested in hex because, as many of you have mentioned, it will really hack into chromosome biology across all organisms, so not just humans, but it will really push the boundary on many different things. And if hex get too controversial, I might go into lizards and do like dragon artificial chromosomes, but this is the goal, which is to hack chromosome biology. Um, and so what makes a good hack? And in terms of building a synthetic genome, what do we need to do with a hack before we can do that? And there's a, there's a way to score hacks for us. And um, I'm gonna go through the criteria. So the first really important thing is segregation. Having a hack that's centromere competent, and this is, this is the core of chromosome biology. If you can't segregate your hack, it doesn't work. 
Um, and the next thing is compatibility. And this is what gives Hex a leverage above viral plasmids or you know, random pieces of DNA, which is compatibility with the system. And this is a lesson we can learn from yeast and bacterial plasmids and vectors. They work with the system, they come from nature, they are expressed, they are recognized by cells, but in human biology, we haven't breached that barrier that much. So we keep trying to use viruses and things that will be attacked by human cells will be silenced and degraded. And so our objective of the hack is to make something compatible. Next thing is, is organization. So we don't want to just create a jumble of DNA that you throw in and you don't know what happens to it anymore. You want to know what exactly is in your hack and what it looks like while it's in the cell and if it gets passed on with integrity to the next few cells. Uh, it has to be replication competent. If it doesn't replicate, it's not useful. And uh, expression is also super important. If you can't express of your hack, uh, it's not useful again. Um, and the last, and I'd say that in the last two decades, we've made significant progress on hacks in terms of meeting these criteria. And now for our lab, we really want to hit the last one, which, which is shuttleability. And what this means is being able to shuttle it, like yeast vectors into bacteria or yeast and manipulate them, construct them, and then put them into human cells. And this will accelerate development of hacks so quickly and genome synthesis as well, because if you can use the tools we have right now that work really efficiently, building megabases of DNA in yeast and then shuttling it into human cells, that will make it so much more multiplex and high throughput than we could ever achieve right now. So I'm um, just gonna talk about the last two decades of hacks and what they look like. And I'm really glad that uh, Vladimir has gone ahead of me because now you guys are up to speed on hacks. Uh, so <laughs> one way is top down, like I mentioned. So taking a naturally existing human chromosome, this is, so this is the group from Japan. And what they did was that they chopped this up, they removed all of the bits in between the centromere and the telomeres. So all you have are the core and the ends. And this is now uh, about five megabases. It's been truncated um, and it's in chicken cells. The other way is to go from bottom up. So de novo, taking a small piece of uh, centromeric repeat, for example, and then amplifying that and throwing it into uh, human cells and hopefully getting something that exists, like persists as, as a hack. And so this is what uh, Vladimir's group has done. And um, both of these hacks are now in troll cells where you can load genes on via recombination and then use um, microcell MMCT to transfer those chromosomes into your cell line of interest. Um, so this process is still in development, as has been discussed. Um, but we're trying to sort of go back to square one and see if we can make more well-defined hacks, maybe, or make it a faster, more efficient process. So um, while well, Vladimir has sort of gone through his illustrious career of making hacks, I'm going to talk about our modest beginnings of making hacks. Uh, I've been about a postdoc for a year and a bit now, and this is what we've done. I'm going to run through it. Uh, we've redesigned the hack and centromere. We've found a way to assemble it, and we also, uh, we've also made a way to deliver really large hacks, so megabases in size. So uh, I'm going to run through our design of the centromere. Um, centromeres are really repetitive, and this has been a big problem in terms of avoiding recombination or rearrangement, and we wanted to minimize this as much as possible. We went back to uh, this uh, consensus sequence back in 1987, and we removed as much of the repeats as possible, keeping only conserved motifs and inserting lactosides. So in this case, you can see that many of the nucleotides can be uh, varied. So the longest stretch of any repetition is actually just that lag or repeat. And we've uh, made it so that the lack of repeats will recruit a fusion protein of any type. SENPA is one option, but there are many different proteins in the human cell that can help to establish centromere function. And this is our hack design. So it's built on a yak because, again, we wanted to be able to shuttle between bacteria, yeast, and human cells, and we want to build it in yeast because yeast is really good at re uh, assembling really large and complex sequences. Um, so, again, it's been a yak, and as you can see, the yak can be linearized by cutting in the middle of a his gene. This means that there's the option of making your hack linear. Um, we also have selectable markers like GFP and a drug resistance gene that is also an origin of replication, as well as the centromere, which, uh, as I explained, has a way to self-perpetuate. Insulators prevent uh, reorganization of your chromosome and also human telomeres. So we've, we're in the process of putting in the telomeres, but right now we're already, already testing and design with the centromere in it. 
Um, it's currently only 30 KB in size, which is pretty shocking for a lot of people, but there are studies have shown that you can work with much less. So a centromere as big as 5 KB in human cells is capable of being a centromere. Um, and the way we've done it through assembly has been quite complicated. It took us about a year to make this hack because of all the repeats and the large uh, centromere and telomeres again. Uh, but the best way to do it, in our experience, is through tar assembly, which is to throw all your fragments into yeast with overlapping ends. And this works on the scale that's much better than any in vitro method that is out there right now. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk about some work that we've done to show that we can deliver megabases of DNA from yeast into mammalian cells. And this is a really big barrier because you can't do this just through lipofactamine. You expose your DNA to too much damage in the process. But this means that you can now start creating hacks of megabases in yeast and pushing it into human cells. And you can get this at a rate of one in, one, one in 300 cells would get the hack when exposed to the yeast. So a nice thing about it too is that if you have yeast that have your hack, you can deliver proteins too. And my collaborators managed to give human cells herpes through this method. So they assembled the herpes uh, genome in yeast and also delivered it with proteins into human cells and they've shown that the cells get herpes. So this is a super non-fun way to get herpes. Uh, so right now, I mean, I'm going to run through it a little, but the, the key ingredient here is arresting the cells in mitosis because this removes the nuclear membrane and it makes it easier for your hack to get into uh, the human cell and get accepted into the nucleus when it reassembles. And so again, the rates, if you compare 12 KB hack up to one megabase hack, there's virtually no difference. They're all about one in 300 or like one in a thousand cells will get your hack. And this is super amazing because again, you can make so much with this. Um, and so that concludes my talk. I just wanna say that we're testing the hack now. And this work has mostly been funded by uh, DAPA and has been a collaboration between my lab, Pam and John Glass at JCVI. David's been working on the yeast to mammalian cell fusion technique and Jeff has been really instructive in the design of the hack as well. And I knew I have recently got a master's student, so I'm not the only one, only one building the hack and testing in the lab. Uh, and yeah, these are my acknowledgements. Yep. Thank you. Uh, question? Uh, First of all, that, that was a marvelously clear presentation. Thank you. Including the slides, they were great. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask, which, which different types of mammalian cells have you, have you done this in? Um, mainly we're testing in hack phase, which is because it's so easy to transfect. And uh, we have protocols for the yeast to mammalian cell fusion, optimized for hack cells, viral cells, I mean, even mosquito cells. So the protocol is really easy, and you can achieve rates of one in a thousand in delivery. Uh, but first, we're doing hack cells, but we'll definitely branch out into other ones once we troubleshoot the hack. So I don't expect it to be an overnight like, miracle. It's going to need some work. Yeah. Normally, uh, formation de novo kinet or, or, or human artificial uh, chromosome is accompanied by integration into chromosome. Mm -hmm. So only fraction of cells contain hack if you use highly competent alpha satellite DNA, so and even loading of SNP uh, uh, so, uh, uh, protein, for example, uh, so mm -hmm. loading uh, so factors. Did you observe uh, so integration of your cassette into chromosome? So we haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, up to today, we're just, we've just transformed it in, so it's been a week since then. Um, I haven't been able to check whether they've integrated into chromosome yet, so right now we're just trying to check if it can perpetuate for a couple of weeks first. But that's a really good concern, because you don't want your hacks to just randomly in insert into your genome. Yep. Did you say that there's a five, sorry, I'm Leslie Mitchell. Did you say there's a 5 KB centromere that's functional? Did I hear that correctly? Um, no, so we've, we've just made our 5 KB centromere. Um, oh, oh you, you mean other studies, yeah. So what people have done is that they've made about five to 10 KBs of lack of repeats and thrown them into different human cells and tried recruiting different proteins through like a SNPA or h you know, other, other centromere fragments. And they found that it can create a centromere, form a canonical. So then there's segregate. like multimerization of that 5KB. They are not sure or whether there's multimerization. So again, this is a huge problem about whether you get repeats or not. But as far as I know, they, they just insert it, you know, in, a, in an arm of an existing chromosome and they show that it forms canonical oh. at, at that site. Yeah.
I'm going to talk about a project we conducted that I believe will just about half the work you need to do to write the human genome. So that's great. I mean, essentially, we already did half of the work, so why not do the rest of it? <laughs> In which one? OK. Um, so human er, eukaryotic genomes can do exist in various ploidies. And there's a reason why Jeff made Joe's yeast and the haploid genome of haploid form of yeast to make a synthetic chromosome. I guess if you want to write a genome, you would rather do it once than eight times, such as in a strawberry or corn was also mentioned earlier. So I think haploid has a great advantage. And the reason is not just because it has less DNA in it, it also greatly facilitates the analysis of the genome. And I think there's great value of doing this in human cells because ultimately if we want to understand the human genome, we need to be able to change it and as much as we can and to gain the most functional insight. Um, haploid cells, there's of course an absence of complementation by another allele, so whatever you do to the cell should be functionally expressed. Haploid cells are usually just in the germ cells, and these cells do not divide. Neither sperm nor eggs make more eggs or sperm. So the question really was, can haploid human genomes divide? And if a cell that is just haploid, can it also differentiate? So what we did in my lab in New York is we took oocytes, human oocytes, and they have, when they are at meiosis too, they have a replicated genome, sister chromatids, and then they segregate those into a polar body, so they, they just segregate sister chromatids, so the oocyte is already haploid. But then you have a single unreplicated genome at the one cell stage, these are the polar bodies from the my meiotic divisions, and then you start development as a haploid, these, these cells start development as a haploid um, cell. Uh, occasionally, the cell does not divide, and then you have two nuclei in one cell, which generates a diploid cell. So in, you end up with cells, a mixture of cells, when you derive a cell line that's both haploid and diploid cells in there. So what we had to do, and this was done in collaboration with the lab of Nissen Ben Venisti at Hebrew University, is to isolate those cells. And this can be done simply by staining those cells with Hux and then analyzing them in a fax and sorting them. And you can see here, the, the more intense the Hux staining is, the more DNA it has, the less intense it is, the less DNA it has. And so haploid cells in G1, the unreplicated ones, they would be unique. There is no diploid cell that has as little DNA as a haploid unreplicated cell. And this way, we can generate highly pure cells that are haploid. Um, you see that here, and this would be the karyotype. What these cells do is we can, they can be highly enriched, but over time, uh, cells do diploidize. So when a cell fails cytokinesis, and even it's just a fraction of the culture, because there's no reversion to haploidy, the, uh, the cell culture gradually becomes more and more diploid, so sorting needs to be repeated perhaps every three to four weeks. The karyotypes are stable. Um, they, have a, they don't have specific deletions or duplications that would make them pseudo-diploid. They're truly haploid. And there are easy ways to check for their ploidy. One that I really like is uh, simply do an immunostaining and you check the number of centromere spots that works well in uh, ES cells, it doesn't work so well in differentiated cells. And if the number of those is around 23, it's a haploid nucleus. If it's around 40 or to 46, it's a diploid nucleus. You can also do fish, but this is a technique that's established in every single lab and it's very easy to do. And so is sorting, it's, it's not hard to, to purify those cells. There's only very few differences between haploid cells and diploid cells, surprisingly. Um, they cluster in terms of gene expression. 
Um, but of course, they have one X chromosome. In human embryonic stem cells, they often inactivate one X, and that means the ratio of X to autosome, which is what shows here, that would be the exome in gene expression, um, is one to one, uh, one, one to two, so two autosomes to one X chromosome in, in those X inactivated diploid cells, while haploid cells have an active X chromosome and the ratio is one to one, so relative to the autosomes, the X chromosome is slightly overexpressed. But this doesn't seem to affect those cells um, in a remarkable way. They're also smaller, they have a smaller volume, and they have a less total RNA. Um, we know that they can be transfected, they can be used for genetic modification. We did proof of principle genetic screen on that. This just shows that they are amenable to genetic manipulation. And the question we then had, can they differentiate into various cell types? Various eukaryotic organisms can exist as haploids, as listed here, so, but we didn't know for, for human cells what they're capable for. And what you see here, we differentiated those cells into various lineages and cell types. Here you see um, neurons. Again, the haploid, this would be the fact sort. The majority of the population is haploid. Here the centromere staining. Then the same for uh, cardiomyocytes and the same for uh, endodermal cells. We also made some beta cells, not shown here, but these are pancreatic progenitor cells and they too um, haploid. Again, there's a trend to more cells becoming diploid, but the significant fraction remains haploid. What you can see here is a, a so-called teratoma, which is the in vivo differentiation of these stem cells. And you can see that a surprisingly high number in these different, highly differentiated structures is actually haploid here, fish, and uh, fax analysis. So human cells as haploids have the capability to, to give rise to various differentiated cell types. What is the strength of this system? As I mentioned, it allows us stringent molecular and functional testing of any genetic change. Um, it can be differentiated in, in, in any cell type of interest. So my research over many years has been the target of many ethical studies and uh, the discussion we've had before reminded me very much of, of this. And I think what often happens is that um, there is misinformation that leads to restrictions on research rather than on strong regulation how this is used in the actual application. And I couldn't agree more on this, Scott, that I think the focus should be on what is done with it and not holding back on what research we pursue uh, to determine whether there is value of this and what it could be ultimately be used for. And this is a law that, as of today, still affects stem cell research tremendously, in particular this. The NIH could not be involved in this work. And um, it is because a, a misinformed law equates a human embryo with parthenogenesis. These cells that you've just seen, they have no potential to make a human being and yet they fall under that same law, unfortunately. If asked the NIH um, whether they would consider, reconsider um, including those cells into the reg registry, the answer is no. So um, these are the people who contributed, um, mostly um, like Nissim Benvenisti, very good collaborator at Hebrew University, and um, funding was partially provided by the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, this is Liam Holt again. I was wondering if you had tried to fuse two haploid cells together, two distinct haploid cells. So, well, I mean, these are parts of the genetic ER cells, and then, you know, you're trying to make other genetic ER cells as well, and if you fuse them, you would have a diploid biparental ER cell, for example. Could be done. We haven't done that yet, but right, I think the focus here is on keeping them haploid. There's many things that can, could be done with those cells, clearly. Yeah, Jeff Buka, um 
I was wondering practical question. You said you have to sort them every so often. Yes. What's the mutagenic impact of one round of sorting on the genome integrity? In other words, how many mutations do you accumulate every time you do a cell sorting yeah. experiment? You know, it's a good question. We don't know the answer yet. I mean, there's a Hux stain and there is a low dose of Huey. I suspect there is some, so, some impact, but we haven't quantified it yet. And it looks as if on the, on the level of using those cells, it certainly hasn't affected their function or their ability to grow and differentiate. But uh, Hux in and of itself, and the low dose of UV is not, probably not that toxic. It's, it's regularly used in uh, animal cloning. Um, but I think it's, we have to address that question. So what's the mechanism for diploidization of these cells? We don't know the, uh, the answer to that, but I suspect it's a simple um, lack of cytokinesis in a fraction of the cells. If you grow a diploid ESL culture, you will have a, a portion of tetraploid cells. These cells don't really become diploid anymore, but because they have a supernumerary centrosome, they often uh, divide up normally at the next cell division. So you don't really um, convert your entire culture from, from diploid to tetraploid. In, in, in this case, it, if you would culture for a year um, without sorting, you would probably lose most or all haploid cells. So I will present talk, human artificial chromosome. Uh, so, Vector as a platform for human genome synthesis uh, project. What is human artificial chromosome? This is extra mini chromosome with size 2 of 10 megabase in size, pure kinetochore, single copy per cell, mitotically stable, never integrate into chromosome, and hug base vectors have unlimited cloning capacity. So, uh, 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 there is a uh, common way to uh, generate human artificial chromosome is a bottom-up approach based on transfection of human cells by uh, alpha satellite DNA um, isolated from human uh, centromere. So uh, Hunt Willard demonstrated many years ago that a large block of alpha satellite DNA can... This is a pointer. Okay, uh, demonstrated that large block of alpha satellite DNA isolated from human centromere, when transfer, transfer, transfected to human cells, can form the novo kinetochore, and this kinetochore may be, may be uh, propagated stably during many, many generations. We designed, uh, so we start to work with synthetic alpha satellite DNA, and this is a principle how we can uh, assemble large a uh, large block of alpha satellite DNA for de novo hack formation from dimer of alpha satellite DNA, 340 KB. Uh, rolling circle amplification and assembling in east by recombination, uh, in vivo recombination. Advantage, uh, each nucleotide may be uh, uh, mutated be before uh, amplification. More importantly, we, we can introduce a uh, so site for recognition of protein, that uh, so repressor or lock operator, and amplify and so use this uh, assay for array for uh, hack formation. This slide demonstrates shows a uh, hack generated from alpha satellite synthetic array with known structure, uh, so containing that operator sequence. Hack segregate uh, accurately during mitosis and mitotically stable. This is the structure of the hack, as any other hack uh, then, uh, generated by the novel formation, input DNA uh, so, uh, amplified, and we have approximately one megabase amplifier region. So this hack uh, contained 3,000 copies of that operator sequence. We can target these sequences 
that repressor. Hux, uh, that or HAC has multiple uh, uh, applications, including study organization of kinetochore, HAC as a vector for gene delivery, uh, HAC to measure chromosome instability, and HAC for synthetic biology. I will give you several examples. examples. Uh, we constructed dozen and dozen uh, TET repressive fusion with different proteins in order to target human uh, kinetochore and TET or HAC. I will uh, so talk about today what is important for us, VP16 transcription activator, uh, activator fusion with this protein. We demonstrated that expression or binding of VP16 to, hum to TET or HAC kinetochore immediately disrupt kinetochore and result to uh, HAC loss. So it means that we can regulate so kinetochore in this HAC. This is very important for HAC uh, when we use as a vector as a vector. HAC as a gene delivery system. This is the only HAC with conditional centromere, we, which we can regulate it. And uh, as uh, other HAC have no unlimited cloning capacity. To convert this HAC into vector, so, so we uh, introduce unique uh, LOXP site into HAC, homologous recombination in DT40 cells. This is a long uh, story, but so finally we have uh, human artificial chromosome propagated in CHO cell cells. In these cells, hamster cells, we can introduce any genes with size up to 100, 200 KB into HAC by CRELOX uh, recombination. So if necessary, we, uh, so we multiple integration is impossible in, in, in the HAC. This system was developed Nicholas Lee in our lab. So and system is um, uh, so uh, used combination of, of CRI, FBT1, uh, FTC recombination integrase. So system is cyclic and so so allows assembly of uh, large genomic uh, so region, unlimited number of cycle. We can so introduce in the, the same uh, locus into HAC. As a proof of principle, so, so several human genes, including BRIC1, so were uh, so loaded into, uh, into human artificial chromosome, propagated in CHO cells. So uh, transfer using microcell mediated chromosome transfer procedure to deficient human cells. We uh, prove complementation. For BRIC1, we identified even new function using this system. And uh, we have good control. We can eliminate HAC by inactivation kinetochore. We have original deficient cells. So now HAC about uh, so quantitative uh, measurement of chromosome instability. There is no method for to, to quantify chromosome instability in human cell, but it's, it's very, very important for many reasons. And this is very, very simple test. We have human artificial chromosome containing GFP, fluorescent uh, so protein, and of course cells which contain uh, so, uh, HAC will, will exhibit uh, green fluorescence, cells which lost uh, so will do not. It may be so measured simply by uh, flow, simple uh, flow cytometry. This system is uh, so, so were, uh, were developed uh, to check drugs which affect for chromosome instability. Why is it important? Because recently, right now, so chromosome instability is recognized as a major uh, target for cancer therapy. We have to increase chromosome instability in cancer cell in order to kill specifically cancer cells. <coughs> we did such screen using so, so our test. Uh, 100 approximately drugs currently used for cancer therapy in clinics were ranked for uh, so frequency of chromosome loss. So highest uh, so, uh, so effect was identified for taxol and gemcitabine. Treatment resulted so 60% of cells after treatment lost so HAC and of course lost uh, other chromosome. These drugs unfortunately not new, but so were developed, introduced in clinics 30 years ago. So we can also <coughs> Uh, so, so work for identification of new genes, collaboration with Phil Heater Lab, uh, so, so using the same system. And now hub for synthetic biology. So we have two projects. I will briefly talk, talk about assemble of RDNA array to form nuclear organization center uh, on chromosome 21. 
I remember that there are five clusters of RDNA genes in human acrocentric chromosome. This is a large uh, so, uh, region, uh, so from uh, half to one megabase, and this is a uh, gaps till now in human, uh, so current human genome project. So problem was with cloning, so in human genome project number one. Right now we are working for isolation of genomic fragment corresponding to individual RDNA cluster and close, so last gap in human genome, and is use this clone to assemble entire nuclear organization region in the hub, hack using multi-integrase system. And so cloning is a TAR cloning uh, procedure developed in our, in our uh, so lab uh, so uh, two decades ago, ago. And future direction, close remaining gaps, assemble a chromosome 21 cluster in one in, in the hack, use RDNA hack model to clarify how present additional nuclear organiza organization region affect cell physiology. Last slide, this is a, a main conclusion. Conclusion that HAC may be a good platform for synthetic biology, physically characterize copy number control, control of copy number, stable propagation in different cells, unlimited cloning capacity, opportunity to eliminate HAC by inactivation of its kinetochore, unlimited number of gene uh, insertion, opportunity to transfer from one to another type of cells using MMCT. This is a list uh, so participant my lab and my main collaborator Bill and Show and Hiroshi Masumoto. Thank you for your attention. It's great work. Um, so is there any um, any demonstration of the ability to transmit these um, by sexual reproduction, or are they stable in meiosis one or two? Yes, what, what we did, so, so, we, uh, so we published recently work for so, um, uh, so demonstrating that human artificial chromosome is stable in transgenic mice, uh, so, and so it uh, so can be so propagated in, uh, in, uh, in mice. So, uh, but, so we also so have, uh, so, um, uh, so, uh, um, uh, this is collaboration mostly so with Mitsuo Shimura. He did a transfer of human artificial chromosome into uh, uh, embryonic human cells. He also, uh, in collaboration with us, he so designed new model for uh, I IPS uh, prog uh, reprogramming. So huge block, approximately 120 GB was loaded into back. Uh, into HAC, human artificial chromosome, and this uh, so block was suggested by, uh, uh, by a new, uh, so, um, uh, so, uh, new information about what is necessary for cell reprogramming. So it's stable in embryonic cells and sta stable in, in, in mouse, and so can be passed through meiosis. So idea that so this system may be used as a platform to assemble so so large block synthesize uh, so in vitro or uh, isolated from so so chromosome and we can I forgot to tell that so we have uh, so the, there are two different versions of artificial chromosome socola and linear with telomeres so it's principle the same. Hello, I'm, hello, I'm Yinan. Uh, just a quick question: How long can your passage a hack in human cells? Uh, so, could you please repeat? Yes. How long can you um, passage your uh, artificial chromosome in human cells? So, how to transfer, right? So, so, so no. Um, how, oh, what's the stability during passage? Uh, stability is very so. So, it's a uh, uh, mitotic stability of human artificial chromosome approximately. So, if you will compare with normal uh, so chromosome, approximately five to ten times low only. So, uh, so this is approximately the same stability as the stability of normal chromosome, but uh, uh, very, very careful uh, so measuring till that a little bit low, but not dramatically. So it's principally like normal chromosome. Uh, what's the current of? Uh state of art to transfer such a large chromosome into the into the mammalian cells and is there any way we can 
do that in a high throughput fashion. So you're talking about transfers of hack? Yeah, how to deliver. How to de for delivery, so, 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 so original so protocol developed, developed uh, so in 1977 by Frank Radl, microcell mediated chromosome transfer is working till now. Many modifications of this procedure was done by so, uh, Mitsuo Ashimura lab, so in uh, so, uh, uh, Tatori University. So, so this, this is, uh, now so this is very, very efficient uh, procedure, and so, so, uh, so we can, uh, so, um, uh, but so, uh, for so we can transfer so, so one hack from, uh, hack from one cell to another cell with high efficiency. So this is a recent modification in uh, Mitsuo Ashimura lab, and so also we so published uh, so modification recently, so just recently, this procedure. So this is, uh, uh, and we also demonstrated that so this procedure is not uh, dangerous. So we have no uh, chromosome rearrangements during uh, microcell-mediated chromosome transfer. 